first to say some things first about myself. I work at Cyprus University of Technology, so I'm essentially in academia. How many of you are practitioners? Can you raise your hands? Oh, not that many. Okay, so I try to design those slides and this presentation a bit to make some simple takeaways for practitioners. So I'm trying to oversimplify things, perhaps, at some point. What I will be talking, I will be giving some examples of the work that we do in my lab on uh, motivating people to change their behaviors. But I will try to give a bit, to, to start from a bit of a broader perspective. Doesn't work. Can we change? Okay, now it works. So, this is 1940s. What you see here is the ENIAC mainframe, operated by a computing expert, right? What you all probably all know. Fast forward to the 1980s. This is the era where personal computers started becoming commonplace. And they were used by different professionals to do different things, even for leisure. This was the foundation, I think, of our field. So the grand challenge was how can we design technologies so that they're easy to use by different people? When we got to the new millennium, we started thinking that perhaps usability is not the only predictor to market success. So we started thinking about how can we design technology that provides a pleasurable experience. And we started talking about new qualities in interaction, such as aesthetics, fun, pleasure, etc. Right? And what I would like to say today is that I think we're actually now witnessing a new paradigm shift. We start talking more and more about designing for well-being. And the key question here is how can we design technology that, is, that has a positive impact on people's lives? And I would like to claim that this is increasingly difficult because we're not just designing for the immediate experience people have with technology, but we're trying to design for the long-term benefits that we might acquire through interacting with the technology. I will give you an example through talking about personal informatics, or what you might know as quantified self. So, personal informatics are actually tools that help us track our behaviors, emotions, or thoughts. And we can nowadays track a lot of different aspects of our behaviors. We can track our physical activity, we can track how we spend our money, or we can track how we spend our time. And I think the essence of these technologies is that it's not just about tracking our lives, but there is a promise that through tracking these aspects of our behaviors, we have the potential to encourage, these technologies have the potential to encourage positive behaviors. We have the ability to make our lives a bit better. And I will try to motivate this um, by talking a bit uh, about the importance of behavior change. And I will, talk, I will try to exemplify this in the domain of health. We all know that human behavior is a key predictor for our long-term health, right? But even though we do know it, we often indulge in non-beneficial activities and we often avoid doing beneficial ones, right? We will eat the chocolate even though we know we'll gain fat. We will avoid doing physical exercise even though that we know that this is actually good for us. We know that diabetic patients keep their insulin medication about 25% of the time. So because of this, we have about 25,000 people in a year that go blind. We have hundreds of thousands of people that lose limbs. And that should be a problem that should be solved. Should be, it it's a, should be practically solvable. Because we have invented the true technology, the insulin. And the behavior causes a lot of problems. If we move to the domain of physical activity, the World Health Organization says that over 80% of the adults worldwide are not sufficiently physically active. And we know that insufficient physical activity is a key risk factor for the so-called non-communicable diseases. Or this can be, for instance, heart diseases, can be diabetes, cancer, etc. <coughs> and this also called chronic diseases account for 40% of the mortality cases and 75% of the healthcare costs, and they're estimated to increase by 42% by 2023. So what is happening is we're actually having a lot of policymakers, a lot of governments worldwide starting to think about how can we move to a new healthcare problem that stresses prevention rather than cure. 
So for instance, Gordon Brown is talking about the NHS of the future. That is one of patient power with patients engaged and taking control of their own health and healthcare. And within this uh, landscape, all these behavior change technologies can be really instrumental for this transition because they can empower people to track their own health and to implement changes that will be beneficial for their long-term health. So the question for us is how do we design for behavior change? And as it was said before, behavior change, you might probably all of you know that it's a really difficult thing for all of us to do. We all want to go to the gym, but we often procrastinate, we postpone it for the future. Um, so you can imagine that if that's a problem for individuals, that's really a problem for designers. How can you design a technology that promotes behavior change without the intervention of individuals, without having a coach to motivate you? And what I will kind of suggest as a process, I think it's something we all do. This is the classic HCI mantra. What we have to do is to, to engage in a theoretically and empirically designed, grounded design process. Right? So what does theoretically grounded design mean in this context? It means adopting behavior change techniques that are evidence-based. So techniques that have been tried, that have been in, studied in a lot of randomized controlled trials, and that we have a lot of evidence that they actually work. And this is what we classically do in HCI. We try to go to other domains and we try to learn from them, appropriate the knowledge and make it design relevant. What you see here is a taxonomy of 93 behavior change techniques organized in 15 overall categories, but I will try to just describe two very popular ones. <coughs> Um, Self-monitoring is the very simple idea that the simple act of measuring one's target behavior, like how much I walk, and comparing it to an external standard or a goal, like how much should I walk, will result to lasting improvements in my behavior. So technologies do that, help us in self-monitoring through automatically tracking our steps, for instance, and they provide this data back to us in, using graphs, using counts and different things, and they try to support us in monitoring our behaviors. Goal setting is another very popular technique. It's one of the techniques that we have a lot of evidence of for its efficacy. Goal setting theory basically suggests that if we self-set goals that are important to us, that are specific, that are proximal in the near future, and that are difficult, then we will, are more likely to perform better. So rather than wishing to be fit in the summer, we might as well say, I will walk 10,000 steps a day. And Fitbit, for instance, will provide feedback on how well we're doing in the course of the day. For instance, Fitbit Flex has five LEDs, with its LED lighting up when you complete another 20% of your goal. So the next question is, uh, is this really, are we done? So is this really sufficient? If we adopt behavior change techniques that we have evidence that they work, can, we, can this guarantee that our design will work? And I think the answer you would all say is that no, not necessarily. Because there is a difference between a theory and an instance of a theory, for instance, our design. So how we might have implemented, uh, for instance, goal setting might differ from the ways it, has, it was implemented in the studies uh, of the past. And it could be also that our population is different. So things might work different than in previous studies in the theory. So what we need to do is we need to test whether our assumptions hold. And to do that, we need to evaluate these technologies, to give them to people and to see how, how things play out. So what's really complicated here is that we cannot really evaluate these technologies in the lab. We have to give them to people in real life, and we have to uh, look at how they interact with it and, and whether these interactions promote certain behaviors. And I think there are at least three ways to go about it, uh, at least three ways we have used in uh, our lab. 
The first one is we instrument technologies. So for instance, we develop a mobile app or a smartwatch app. And then we have some code that logs all the interactions that people have. We publish it on Google Play. And then we look at how people interact with the technology we designed. And we also look at the physical activity. And we can actually try to look, does physical activity, does the engagement correlate with physical activity? So one of the problems with these is that you don't have a lot of the context of you know when, how frequently, where people interact, but you don't know the exact location, you don't know the social context. So another way you can, we have tried, for instance, is to strap wearable cameras on people, and we can monitor, we can capture a day in the life of people. And this tell, can tell us a lot of things about the social context. Is someone around when somebody is using his mobile phone? Uh, we can, it can tell us the physical context, when somebody is, what is he doing, is he working, et cetera. And the last thing one can do is to use experience sampling, which is the simple idea that you can have sort questionnaires that pop up at some times in people's mobile phones, for instance. And, the, and this can happen actually, I think, in two basic ways. One is random. So you can actually send questionnaires randomly in the course of a day, and people can answer two, three questionnaires in a day. Or it can be event triggered. When, so for instance, when something happens, um, you can pop up a questionnaire. For instance, if you detect that someone has been sedentary for over an hour, you can ask him, how do you feel? What are you doing now? Etc. And the grand, uh, the motivation for experience sampling is you try to avoid the memory biases that exist if you would have a questionnaire at the end of the day or at the end of an interaction session. Psychologists typically say that the cold is the, the cold is the unit of psychological presence, and they say that this is about three seconds. So actually, if you punch me in the face, I will have access to this experiential information for about three seconds. After that, I will have to rely on my memory. And then I will have a lot of memory biases in my reports. But all in all, there are actually these three ways I can see of uh, studying those technologies in real life. And I will talk about um, today only about some interaction logs, some, some log-based studies uh, that we have run. And I will talk about two studies. The first one is um, a study where we designed our own tracker, a mobile app called Habito. Um, and Habito basically used three strategies, design strategies that are commonplace. And we wanted to see how people interacting with those uh, design strategies with this interface and what impact did it have on physical activity. The first one is goal setting. So what, when you install Habito, it asks you how much do you want to walk per day. And then you say, OK, I want to walk eight kilometers. And what it does, it splits these eight kilometers in four milestones. And then you can say, every moment, for instance, it would tell you, OK, it's awesome. You have already walked 2.2 kilometers. And there's another 1.7 or 1.8. There's a rounding problem here uh, towards your next goal. And then it gives you constant feedback about how well you're doing. The second thing is it presents historical data. And we try to contextualize this data. So what we do basically is we look at the locations where you spend time. And we color code those locations depending on how sedentary or how physically active you were. So for instance, here it will say, for instance, at half past 12, you, get, you came to the University of Matera. And then around 1.47, you walked 100 meters to your car. And then uh, you drove by uh, for 20 minutes. And at 2 o'clock, you reached the Madeira Interactive Technologies Institute. And we color code these as uh, uh, orange because you have been somewhat sedentary. The idea with this is that we provide the knowledge about where people exercise, where people are physically active. So gradually, they can become aware of their patterns and their behaviors. For instance, they can see that you know, when I go to the University of Madeira, I'm actually not walking at all. So perhaps I should do something about it. And the last strategy is using tailored messages uh, that try to motivate actions. 
And we actually had two different categories, informational versus persuasive messages. Just to give you two examples, for instance, the one in the bottom says, you still haven't taken any breaks at your current location, try walking a bit every half an hour. So for instance, when somebody was sedentary for over 30 minutes, we would send this uh, message. Or the other one says, try, try walking uh, when talking on the phone. During your last call with Olga, you were sedentary. That was a lost opportunity. So what we were doing is whenever somebody was actually on the phone, we would sample uh, their physical activity and we would classify them as sedentary or non-sedentary or active. And if somebody was sedentary, you would try to send him this message. So what we wanted to do is to create this habit. Whenever you're on the phone, you're probably not working. You have the capacity to walk around. OK, so these were the three uh, strategies. And what we did was we uh, published Habit on Google Play. And we monitor the usage of Habit of by about 250 people over 10 months of use. The second study uh, is a study where we try to look at how can we design glanceable feedback and how does this work. And we did this in the context of smartwatches. So first we did the design, uh, uh, design process and we had a number of, we arrived at a number of concepts. And then we took some of these concepts and we prototyped them and we gave them to people and we look at how they work in practice. So what I will talk about now is a bit about what are these insights, and I will frame it in the context of looking at whether our assumptions about the way people use these technologies are true. So the first one is that these technologies, and that's often assumed, uh, and it has been, there has been some discussion around it. The question is, are these technologies designed for all? So pretty much, you know, you would naturally suspect that, you know, these are universal tools. They're aimed for everybody, and um, they, everybody would be able to adopt, to take a tool and to track uh, one's physical step, one's uh, physical activity, and uh, get motivated. So what we did was we used, and we sent a questionnaire to people in the Habito study, and we classify them in terms of their stages of behavior change. So there's a theory around five stages that people go through when they try to change their behaviors. The first stage is pre-contemplation, where you currently have no intention to change your behavior, to be, to be active. And then you move on to contemplation, where you intend to be active, but you're not yet. And then you move into preparation, where you're trying, you're already implementing some, some things in your life, but you're not regularly active. And then the action stage, you're reg regularly active, but for less than six months, and the maintenance stage, you're active for over six months. Okay, so what we found was, we looked at the adoption rates of Habito, and we found that people in the contemplation and the preparation stage had about 50% adoption rate. People in the pre-contemplation, the action of the maintenance, had about 20% adoption rate. So what this tells us is that Habito perhaps also all activity trackers, because the design strategies are quite similar, work mostly for the guys in the intermediary stages of behavior change. So these are the guys you would say that have the motivation, they're not in the pre-contemplation stage, but they don't have the means yet, right? So they don't know what they can do exactly to increase their physical activity. And this is a problem because actually these two uh, 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 column, these two uh, columns are actually about 50% of the sample. So there's another 50% of the people that downloaded our app that are in the other three stages, and that we're doing a pretty bad job in catering for the needs. So you, you, you could ask, how can I design trackers for people that are in the pre-contemplation stage? Um, so what happens usually is if you're, if these guys that are in the pre-contemplation stage have a really weak understanding of how little they exercise. And when they install a tracker, the tracker says, OK, you walk 2,000 meters a day. And you should be walking 8,000 meters a day. So for some, this is really motivational. Right? They, try, they rapidly change some things in their lives. But for others, this creates reactance. Right? They say, OK, physical activity is not for me. I'm not doing well anyhow. 
So the question here would be, how can you design trackers that increase self-efficacy? How can you make people believe that they can actually achieve the eight kilometers per day? And this is something I think we're not doing well yet. Uh, the second assumption is around the use of goal setting. And as I said before, goal setting theory says that self-setting a specific proximal, et cetera, et cetera. What I want to stress is the self-setting. So the assumption is that the goal is important for you, walking more, and B, you think about how much you should walk. So you create, you set your own goal. Now, and we also found in the habit of study, and this has been found repeatedly in prior studies, that guys that set their own goal tend to walk more than people that adopt the goal that proposed by the system. Um, but what we found was that the self-setters, the people that set their own goal, was only 30% of uh, the people that used, that downloaded Habito. And the rest just accepted the preset goal. And the interesting thing was that the preset goal, we set it to a very low level in order to make it very clear to them that you have to define your own goal. So that is, for me, this, that's, that's a question. You know, if people are not going through the process of thinking, how much do I walk? walk, do I want to walk, and uh, setting their own goal, perhaps the way goal setting works in real life is really different to what goal setting theory was telling us in all, all those control studies. Um, uh, the, the other assumption that we have is that there is, that, that comes from the quantified self-community, and that is the assumption that behavior change comes through the knowledge that we gain through these technologies. So the idea is that we monitor our steps, we find out, we can find out, for instance, that on Mondays I tend to be more inactive, or I find out that in different locations, in some locations I'm more inactive, and this leads to insights, and then I can take appropriate action. So I can try to walk more when I go to a certain location, I can try to introduce some walking activity on Monday, et cetera. But what we found with Habito was that less than 30% of the sessions, of the usage sessions, did people look at uh, historical information. So very rarely people look at historical information. And even more, 87% of, of those 30% was looking at the ongoing day. So if the question is, how frequently do co people go back to look at their past days, it's only 4% in our sample. So that's really low. And then what we found was that also 57% of all user sessions were what we called glances, where these are very brief intuition, median five seconds, and people don't do anything. So they slide, they open the app, for instance, they look at the screen, most likely, I would suspect, they look at how much have I walked today, and they close it. And this even increases to 73% after a couple of months of use, after a couple of weeks of use. So what this is telling us is that the dominant use of the trackers is not really one that is aimed for knowledge, that people acquire rich knowledge about their patterns of behavior, but rather, people use these technologies to regulate immediate behavior. I look at my tracker, how well am I doing, and then I might make little changes in my life. I'll tell, give you another example. Uh, in this uh, study, in the smartwatch study, we designed this uh, watch face called an Android. The idea was the primary function of a watch is to check the time. Uh, but at the same time, I can display some physical activity information on the periphery. That's really a benefit because we tend to watch our smartwatches about 100 to 150 times a day. So you can actually provide very frequently feedback to people about physical activity. So what this does is you see the, the, the little lines, white lines, are one minute, basically. So the full circle is the past hour. The blue lines are the moments where you were physically active. Right? So if it's all white, you mean, it means that over the past hour, you were completely centenary. If, if you have two blue uh, periods, then you had two breaks of sedentary activity. 
This is really different from traditional trackers. Why? Because trackers mostly try to promote, to motivate you to walk eight kilometers a day. What this tries to do is to try to break sedentary activity. So it says that you, know, you shouldn't stay for one hour uh, sedentary. And that's really important because we know that sedentarism is a key health risk factor independently of how much you walk. So you might be walking 10 kilometers a day, but you might be spending three hours of being sedentary, and that's bad for your health. So what we, asked, what we wanted to do here was, what, every time people checked at their watch, then we counted how much time did they take till to initiate a new walking activity. And what we found was the participants were more likely to initiate a new walk activity when seeing a low number of steps in the last hour. And in fact, participants who saw that they walked 10 or less minutes over the past hour had 77% chance of starting a new walk in the next five minutes. So what basically this tells us is that these little snippets of information have a strong potential to encourage behavior change. Rather than providing a lot of information to people, and hoping that they will gain knowledge, we should rather focus on how can I change the system architecture, what we often uh, recall as nudging. How can I nudge people to make little changes in their behavior to um, uh, eventually resulting in stronger changes overall? And this is supported by dual process theory. Uh, for instance, Kahneman calls this the system one and system two. System two, there, these are two different ways of making decisions. System two is a rational mind, so what we often call analytical reasoning. So I weight all the pros and cons of my decisions, and then I take the decision that is the optimizing the outcome. But if you think about it, most of the time, we're actually not doing this. I'm not going to weight all the pros and cons to stand up and take a walk. I rather rely on the automatic mind, on the intuition. And the problem is that if you look at, there was a survey from Adams, and which found that 94% of all systems designed for, out of those that they studied were designed for the rational mind. So the idea was provide knowledge to people, they will gain insights. So there's only 6% of the systems that were designed for the automatic mind. Um, and I think the potential here is to shift these towards asking how can behavior change the technology support self-regulation. The, the fourth and final thing, um, which is pretty commonplace, I think you all have much experience, is that unexpected things are uh, only expected, right? They, they were certainly ex expected to happen. So I'll tell you one example that happened in our case. So we designed those, uh, this smartwatch interface. What you see here is the blue, cir the blue circle is your goal progress. So if it's full, it means you have completed 100% of your goal. The inner circle is actually the, the progress at this time of the people that had, of other people that had the same goal as you. So what we did is we took a Fitbit data set of about 10,000 days of people. We segmented it in five minutes blocks. And then every five minutes, we would know people that had an eight kilometer goal, how much did they walk on average. So every time you would check your words, we would compare are you ahead of others, or are you behind others? Uh, so what we found was that participants had really different behaviors in relation to how far ahead of others, behind others they were. So if they were close to others, they would strive to do better. But if they were far ahead of others, or if they were, they were far behind others, they would be more relaxed. So what happened was that um, we did a mistake in the... Uh, in the calibration of the data set. And most of the time, people were far behind others. And that really demotivated people. So it's, you can imagine that these things are actually expected to happen in many different ways. For instance, there was a study from Ed King who uh, took two groups of people. One group, she asked to count their steps. Another group, she asked to just walk without counting the steps. So the, the self-monitoring, the ones that counted the steps, had an increase in physical activity, but they also had a decrease in the enjoyment of walking. Right? And this is really problematic, because you can ask the question, do all these technologies help us to change, to optimize our behaviors in the short term, but could they bring negative, adverse effects over the long term? 
And this is what we call often the overjustification effect. When you have extrinsic motivation, lag, budgets, points, steps, they overshadow the intrinsic ones. We forget to enjoy walking. And I think this, this brings quite some implications uh, for the design process. So to conclude, I think, you know, I, I will just try, try to make these broad claims. Uh, the one thing is that no matter how theoretically grounded your design is, you have to test it in real life. And the second thing is that we have to question what our assumptions are about how people will use the technology and why people will use the technology. And with that, I want to finish. And I want to say also, if you're more interested in exploring some bits of our work, this is the lab uh, website, uh, Persuasive CAD CCI. Um, and also, if there are any prospective PhD students here, please, I'm looking for PhD students currently, contact me. Thank you.